All right, Heather, thanks. Well, all morning we've been talking about the uh, scrub launch mm -hmm. uh, from Artemis in Florida. Yep, here to discuss the decision, Jim Kidrick from the San Diego Air and Space Museum. We want to welcome you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, even though the plans have changed, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, so real quick, let's get to this. Two hours before scheduled takeoff, they decide we're going to scrub the launch, right. fuel leaks, an engine problem. Can you talk to us a little bit about what goes into this type of decision? Well, for the launch director, there's a whole bunch of things from down range, you know, an airplane could have flown into the area, a boat could have, uh, you know, come into, uh, you know, uh, their zone that they protect. Uh, in this particular case, of course, it was with the, the rocket itself, uh, but uh, uh, being very cautious, especially in this first launch, Artemis 1, uh, you know, it's, a, it's really a great decision because there's no rush. It's not like it has to get airborne this morning and they're going to be able to push it off till I think the first opportunity is this coming Friday. Uh, but, uh, but it's a great decision because once again, you've got a whole bunch of newness out there. Uh, certainly a, a new uh, launch platform itself, the SLS, uh, as well as really a, uh, a, 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 I don't want to say a rookie team, but a very new team mm. when you compare it to the old Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo uh, mm. uh, teammates, which we had on a Zoom call with us this morning, the entire time, Gene Krantz, Jerry Griffin, and Milt Windler, and I'll tell you, it was just, a t uh, uh, you know, it was history. Uh, hearing them talk about all this stuff was Pretty cool, boy. That yeah, that sounds real cool, <laughs> man. Uh, with this, have you looked into what the problems were? Equipment. -wise? Well, they they had a bleed valve, uh, you know, challenge this morning. Mm -hmm. um, the rocket has to go through almost a super cooling uh, process, and they use the hydrogen and the oxygen to do the cooling of the engine. So, and I mean everything that has to do with the engine has to be very, very cold. So when they do the ignition, because now it's going to take it to uh, super hot, okay, so that it's not, you know, one thing that is, a, 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 I want to say, almost a disparate temperature uh, compared to the oxygen and the hydrogen. Because once they turn the valve, the hydrogen and oxygen used to cool the engine and all its components turns into the propellant. So mm. the hydrogen is the propellant, the oxygen is the oxidizer, uh, and it has to have the oxygen because once it gets up there, uh, there's no oxygen, there's no real air that they can use. Mm. And I mean, it goes without saying, it's better to be safe than sorry. Oh. And granted, it's unmanned for now, um, but how common are these types of issues that, that come up before prior to a launch? They're actually pretty common yeah. uh, for certainly uh, ensuring that the mechanics are perfect, okay, that it's going to be flawless because they need a good launch. But then as, uh, as we've all seen also, they have had some weather that looks like it's coming in and, and just a little bit of rain and the mm -hmm. thunderstorms. You know, this is the time of year where they have that in the southeast U.S. So it's a great decision, really. Uh, and you can imagine the uh, the amount of pressure on that launch director mm -hmm. when they finally say mission scrubbed because certainly in naval aviation uh, you know the worst thing you can do is cancel a flight okay and then 20 minutes later oh hey it looks like it's going to run oh. and then ramp everybody yeah. back up mm. you are sure to have a you know a problem mm. yeah you mentioned the next possible launch is friday gives them a little time. I imagine the troubleshooting on this yes. has to begin right away. It's, it's, uh, it's already begun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on, on what changes they have to make or fix, uh, whether or not it's Friday or some other opportunity after that. But once again, tough decision, mm -hmm. but a right decision. Well, we were talking about how this mission, the initial uh, rocket, it's going to spend 42 days in space. And then hopefully within the next five years, we can send people back up to the moon. I mean, what, what does NASA hope to learn from, from the Artemis mission? Well, this is, and if you go back to the Apollo days, you think of, you know, uh, the fire on one, okay, then the importance of seven, the first time mm -hmm. we're taking this redesigned capsule up into space, and then certainly Apollo 8, you know, right to the moon. So this is pretty darn exciting that they're going to kind of go a one, two, three, unmanned to the moon, manned to the moon, and then manned to, manned to land on the moon. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we're going to see a lot by uh, 2025 and 26. So NASA's back in the game, and that's exciting for all of us, really, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, commercial space does a lot. You know, the Bezos, uh, Musk, effort is significant, but you can hardly pay somebody enough money 
to go to the moon without some sort of a profit, you know, at the end. <laughs> all right. Well, Jim Kidrick joining us this morning. Thank you so much. Great to get your insight on all of this. Appreciate it. Well, we were up at uh, your time. We were up at 315 oh. <laughs> to bring these Apollo flight directors on. Sure. So if you do get a chance, I would recommend going onto the museum's uh, uh, YouTube site. Okay. And we recorded it. And these these gentlemen, this is Gene Kranz, Jerry Griffin, Milt Windler. They are history and it was phenomenal. Well, we'll have to check it out. Fascinating. And yeah. we'll have more on our website. So we'll make sure that we get everyone linked up to that. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, sidewalk vendors along